I am a visual artist working in the visual art field, but in the kind of mid to late 90s, I stepped outside of the art field and did a, an MSc in interactive digital media in Trinity College. Um, it was a very transdisciplinary course with very diverse courses and everything from kind of computer architecture, programming to video production and cultural studies about technology. But the, actually, the most interesting thing to me about that course was actually the students, because all the students came from completely diverse backgrounds. We were historians, programmers, engineers, <coughs> artists, whatever. And we basically spent a year, there's 24 of us in one room, and we argued about absolutely everything. Um, at the time, uh, it was kind of, it was 96, 97, so kind of the, using the web creatively was a kind of a new idea. And CD-ROMs, interactive CD-ROMs were all the rage then. And the idea that you could kind of click and choose your own path through content or through material was a, was a big issue. And uh, we were actually being taught by a novelist, by Anne Enright, who was very um, bogged down with issues of closure. She was very bogged down with how do you call an end to an interactive story? How do you... She saw, she saw closure as something that made sense of what out the story that has happened before. It's that it was necessary to bring things to fruition. Um, it's about, about forming some kind of outcome. But it was while looking at these issues that I really, really, really realized that it, with new technologies and with the kind of issues that come up with them, that actually I wasn't actually interested in closure at all. That actually I was much more interested in the idea of the middle of the story, when things were actually occurring, in ideas about immersion and withdrawal, um, uh, as an act of kind of sight, as a, thing, as a place where things occurred, um, in prioritizing this idea of this in-between space, in, in other words, basically, in kind of developing ideas about process and not outcome. Uh, after the Masters, I, uh, it's when I first began working with Ian Elliott, who's an astrophysicist, astrophysicist from Dunsink Observatory in, in Dublin. During uh, the Masters, I read Einstein's Theory of Relativity, which sounds more complicated than it is. But basically, um, I met with Ian afterwards. I had met him through an ex-girlfriend of my brother's very briefly, and I called him up and asked him to meet me to explain relativity to, to me. A physicist always laugh when I say this because they, I said, you know, in a two hour cup of coffee, they said more like a two year cup of coffee uh, to understand it. But basically, I met with Ian and we hit it off, and uh, he started coming to my studio uh, about once every two to three weeks for kind of half a day. And the initial idea was that we were going to talk about art and physics, and uh, we were both kind of, he just retired, so he's very open to the idea of meeting with me. But basically, it was, um, I, met, I met him because I'd made a film actually which is shot in Potsdam Platz in Berlin, which shows a, a man raising his stick up to a cloud because I was interested in Einstein's theory of relativity where he basically gives an example of distance AB as in suppose a cloud is hovering over Potsdam or Platz in Berlin, that in order to measure the uh, height of the cloud we should erect a pole up to it. And I was so kind of charmed with this idea of raising poles up to clouds in order to measure their height that I went to Potsdam Platz and shot this video. But mostly, I had been filming a lot of clouds at that time, and I knew clouds to be these kind of uh, chaotic systems. They defy any kind of notion of an ordering system. They are turbulent, constantly forming and dissipating. Um, but Ian, when I talked about this with Ian, he basically talked about that this is a Gedanken, it's a thought experiment. Uh, thought experiments, they're very particular to Einstein's way of thinking. He used them a great deal. Basically, a thought experiment is in a test of a hypothesis that's performed in the mind and is useful, useful to think about in order to clarify one's ideas. They usually involve some kind of idealization of existing physical conditions, and they're often unperformable. But Einstein attended a school in Switzerland which emphasized visual thinking, and his insights, of course, led to great discoveries such as that gravity is not actually a force, but how we experience the curving of space. So I can move on the slides. So Ian and I, as I said, we began to meet, and we, I was very interested in physicists' approach to ideas. They have a kind of a desire to demonstrate very complex ideas with a certain economy. You know, they drop balls off buildings to talk about gravity. And I, and I really like this kind of economical, conceptual approach that they take, which I think they share with artists. Um, but and basically, we met for 18 months. And by the time we came to the end, I can go on to the next slide. Um, by the time we came to the end of our discussions, I realized that actually it was our conversations that actually were the most important thing to me. That actually, I started to document us talking and writing, and the thing we had in common was the use of a diagram. We both were very interested in diagrams as a means of explaining so complex ideas. Um, and we actually made quite a few videos together, and we actually co-scripted a work. And, uh, and, and all the time I was doing this work with him, I was thinking that I was going to write this big film, I was going to script this big film about relativity. And really what happened was a whole lot of other things. Um, and actually what I wanted to show you today was something, uh, if you can put on the next thing, it's actually a video which I, at the time I rejected, and it was 10 years later, 
when preparing a talk quite recently about my body work with him, that I came across it again, and I just really liked it. And it just shows us trying to do one of our, uh, a little analogy that Ian had. I would say it's really simple. I would say, if the, starting off saying, if the width of a sheet of paper, you just talk of saying that, how, then you say, if the width of a sheet of paper is 70 years, is a, is a human lifetime, an average human lifetime of 70 years, how many sheets, either how many sheets or how high would you have to stack sheets of paper to represent the age of the universe. And you're unwrapping this, and then you, you have the stack there, and you say, um, it'd be nice to say that that was, actually, mm. it'd be nice to say that that was. You know, that, yes, that's 35,000 years. That's 35,000 years, yes. say. So if we stacked 20 kilometers high. That's what we represent. If, no, if 20 kilometers high should be our last line, yes, last yes. point, so yes, you say, yes. that then the age of the universe will be represented by a stack 20 kilometers high. Yes, this okay. is like a one minute piece. Isn't All right, okay. okay. No, this is a. <laughs> okay, right. So, <clears throat> we can do it both ways again. You know, we'll do it that you say it while we're doing it, and then, oh, actually, you'll look at yeah, the other side. Look at that and we'll, we, Well, we, I need one sheet of paper. Well, no, you don't actually. It's just enough to say with. Just, I think we just want. The thickness. Yeah. The thickness. Yeah. I mean, I can do. You know, we can do that. Well, we can just simply do that, which is supposed to happen. Yeah, okay, hold on a second. No, in front of you. Hold on a second. And you want it. Um, Let's see. Just want to give myself a start on this. See, I don't think that's fair enough. You should struggle. <laughs> You're very cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Malicious street there somewhere. <laughs> okay, so if you just put your hands up, just in the sheet paper in represents a human lifetime, about a seven, 70 years. What height would this need to be to represent the age of the universe? It would need to be 20 kilometers. I would say, actually, it was nice to do, on this paper, I would say, if the width is a this, this sheet of paper represents... Oh yes, the thickness. The, width, the, thickness, the thickness of the sheet of paper. Thickness. Represents so human lifetime. You can just say that. All right. I might not, um, actually, if you can just say that without, without worrying about what's being filmed, it's going to be a voice over. Just say, say yeah, that. Yeah, but I, I sort of like to. Yeah, you, you yeah, can. Okay. <laughs> just to, to just say the whole thing. If the width. Oh, yes. Okay. If the thickness of this sheet of paper represents a human lifetime of, say, 70 years, then a stack. No, I say I haven't got that. And you say the thickness of our sheet of paper. All right, all right, okay. If the thickness of a sheet of paper represents a human lifetime of 70 years, then the age of the universe is represented by a stack 20 kilometers high. Collaboration. This is collaboration, and we're deeply flawed, you know, human beings attempting to do something quite simple. Um, and I, as I said, when I came back to that, I liked it because it showed uh, that he had written this little analogy, and I said, okay, I'll go and try and film this, and it showed how he tried to do it, and it, it, the various attempts at kind of uh, trying to actually just do something together. But that this is collaboration. But anyway, following this period of time working with him, basically what it returned me to an interest in science, the great divide in art and science, which happens in the Leaf School, um, 
I actually, a friend of mine who's a philosopher said he always wanted to stop C.P. Snow, you know, the guy who wrote that, the, twin, the two cultures, that great, that article which talks about the difference between art and science. He said he always wanted to stop him before he went up to the podium and say to him, are you sure it's art and science? Are you sure it's not money and truth? Um, and I think there's a, a lot in that, actually. But uh, essentially, as I said, my attraction to physics is that it gives us extraordinary concepts and shapes, as much as art does. And mostly, but mostly I was interested in understanding the nature of time. I work in film, and film, working in film, you can't separate working from image making with, with time, the ideas about time, which happen in film. Uh, Tchaikovsky, the Russian film director, called uh, cinema sculpting in time. And Gilles Deleuze, the philosopher, talks about how film is a constantly evolving meaning that can never, uh, that remains open and is never resolved because the Im there's no single image that defines a film. And I shot a work, a cinematic work during this time that I thought I'd show you now as well, um, which is called Dustifying Gravity. It's, very, it's a short four minute uh, long take, which I shot in Dunsink Observatory where Ian uh, worked. I just thought I'd show you that as a kind of another work I made during that time. what um, relativity talks about is the dynamic nature of time and space, that you can't think about space without thinking about time, and you can't think about time without thinking about space. There's just one space-time. 
And I mention that because I really think that that's something that we don't, we haven't fully grasped. And that has implications for all kinds of things, I think, in terms of thinking about place, about this place, that you must also think about time and that we must think about long-term thinking and, and different slower tempos than being fast outcome orientated uh, societies. Um, I also worked, you can go on to the next slide, I also did uh, another collaborative project, the mathematician Brandon Guilfoyle, which when we were asked to basically produce a centrefold for a, a magazine, uh, Faint, and Fire Cathy put us together, uh, she asked me and the mathematician to work together, and basically he was looking at uh, caustics. Caust caustics are basically reflections of light inside a curved surface. The most common one you see is inside a coffee cup, if you've ever noticed how light bounces on the inside of a coffee cup and forms a little kind of specific, specific shape on top of your coffee. But he basically had been studying these uh, theoretically as a mathematician. And so when I met with him and he was telling me about his work, I thought, let's try and make one. Let's try and make what, you, what you're looking at theoretically. So we set up, we, we got a, I got a little brass tube and I polished, highly polished the inside of it and I got a little torch and we made this little arm which kind of moved the light source up and down. And basically, it, it, you, we got this incredible uh, caustic. So go on to the next slide. Um, these were his mathematical predictions. These are drawings of his mathematical predictions. This is Leonardo drew caustics. That's that little diagram up there. There's the coffee cup caustic. And essentially, um, we can go on to the next slide. This is the centerfold we made for the magazine. And this is just light. This is, there's nothing else but it's light bouncing around inside a curved piece of brass. And I, I've remained interested in light and the nature of light. Light is, uh, there's a duality to light. It's both... Um, uh, a wave and a particle, and this kind of paradox, which is a real paradigm in physics, um, I think is very interesting. It's very interesting how basically, depending on the experiment, light behaves accordingly. Um, and it's also due to our limitations as observers. Um, I think there's kind of an analogy between, between that and between our conceptions of, of time and history. But another body of work I did was with, about four years ago, I started working with Ruth Byrne, who's a professor of uh, cognitive science, and she's a psychologist in Trinity. I think you can go on to the next slide. Um, she had written a book called The Rational Imagination, uh, which talks about, um, she talks about how research, basically people recognize that uh, rational thought is, is, is quite imaginative, but she also, her book really looks at how imaginative thought is more rational than, than people realize, that they occupy similar processes. Um, and I, I, I contacted her and asked her if she'd be interested in meeting with me uh, to talk about these things. She talks about ideas how, she says, how people often think about um, how things might have turned out if only something had been different. And this installation was called If Only Something Else Had Happened. Um, but basically, Ruth uh, gave me these ideas about uh, the idea that there are fault lines in reality. There are certain aspects of reality that we find more mutable, more changeable, that we can think about changing more readily than others. And that goes right across the sphere. For example, in a football match, if someone almost misses a goal in the last five minutes, everyone says, oh, if only that goal, if only that guy got that goal in, as opposed to looking at the previous 85 minutes, or anything that happened in the previous 85 minutes as being an area for a change. Um, and she thinks that, um, that the, our ability to imagine possibilities, she said that if you, at the beginning of outset of any issue, can imagine two possible outcomes, or two possible scenarios, that your ability to deal with, apparently, the outcomes or whatever happens during that process is, is better. We're better able to cope if we think about the more possibilities we think about. And on, on our ability to think about possibilities is usually always rooted in a very rational way. We don't think about crazy things. We don't say, well, if I went to the moon and came back from the moon. We, we, we cite possibilities. We place them within uh, the things that actually might be true, that might actually work out. Um, so this insulation, but so basically I took, I, I was, when I came into this gallery, it was in the RJ Gallery, James Coleman had done a, an incredible installation and he had this beautiful grey carpet uh, laid down which I was very reluctant to change because it was so nice but I basically what I did was I basically took out the corner of the, the corner section of the tiles and replaced them with a kind of graduated uh, blue sequence uh, in just one corner of this room and then I placed on top of it and went to the next slide a table um, on which I on which uh, it's a bit bleached out but basically I, I root uh, as, a, as a scientist talks about A and B. She talks about A and B. There are four possible versions of what A and B can be. There's A and B, there's A and not B, there's uh, not A and B, and then there's not A and not B. And these are the four logical outcomes of, of the dual system of A and B. But she talked about that in psychology, how when, they, when you introduce content and context, that basically we think about far more things. You can't quantify mathematically the way we think. We don't use logic to solve logical problems. 
And so was, I was interested in kind of somehow making something about that. And so I used different kinds of types of paper. There was gray paper, white paper, and a graduated blue paper. And A and B, in this case, are black and white stones that I collected on a beach, which of course are all similar, though they have a relationship with each other. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, I showed, I went to Lisbon, where she was working with a class of psychology students who were looking at kind of scripted scenarios. Basically in psychology, you get given a script. It's kind of you get given a little description of a, a particular scenario, and you're asked to kind of assess it or to judge it or to think about uh, what makes this, uh, this situation possible or true. And they were specifically looking at intentionality, the reasons and causes for actions, what drives us to take action. And I was interested in it because I was interested in the fact that they had scripts and that there's this kind of like little films that they were kind of script making and they didn't look at narrative studies, so they were using narrative ideas, creative ideas to make, to make facts in psychology. Um, so, and I shot a film, actually, well, actually, I'm just going to the next slide. Uh, I showed on a book, this was a footnote for her, The Nature Explanation, a book by a man, uh, Kenneth Crack, and, this, and I showed another work I did, which was, which was a fictitious work, when I had two characters who have different perceptions of the same event, and there's kind of a certain lack of connection between them. Um, but I was interested in, in using her footnote and my footnote and putting them together. And if you go on to the next slide, actually, I'm just going to show you the last three minutes. This is a 50 minute film, there isn't time. This is her class, there isn't time to show it all. But I'm just going to show you the last kind of three and a half minutes where you see the kind of scripts that the students get. Um, but there isn't if you go back a bit, actually, More strongly. Lead to an action uh, than others. Is there a difference between? Uh, can we capture the clear difference between intentions? Uh, some intentions are more um, strong to 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 lead an action or other than other. And this, uh, this is a, this is a, what is a completely different. Where we're going, I think, uh, research is goes that we have these rigid interpretations in logic. You see, that when you talk about um, material implications, you have these free contingencies. This is one way to, to, to define the material implication. But it's a rigid thing. This is if means free contingencies and, and period. And we see that it's not so, it's it not this is what is happening. There are a lot of different interpretations. And this then is this ten interpretations that we, we talked about. There are a lot more interpretations because there are relations that people, uh, special relations and temporal relations that people can um, build in the representation, and, and it contributes to interpret uh, how, what which is the relation between A and B. You see, and people when people think and draw conclusions, they have. Uh, access to this information, they use this information about time, about space, about other kind of relations, you see. And there's a lot of different interpretation of, 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 of if, for example, a lot of different interpretation. And what defines is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the logical form, the grammatical form, uh, but also knowledge that people have background knowledge, context, and and, uh, and uh, content uh, and and the, the the really what is really difficult and we have no answer for that how people to predict which will the interpretation that people make a given sentence in a given moment we have no answer for that uh, there is no theory that can pre pre for, for predict which will the interpretation that people make these sentences and it would be very interesting to have a, a theory. Uh, solution.
I was kind of interested in uh, exposing my own intentions as a filmmaker uh, in this film, working with this class and intentionality, and that's why I show all the kind of, you know, the framing and the reframing and the camera looking for the next subject, and when people know they're being filmed, even though they all agree to be filmed, of course, they get uncomfortable with it and they look away, and I was interested in exposing all of that with, as a documentary filmmaker, if you like, in the slide from documentary to fiction, so it ends in kind of fiction. Uh, basically, my approach is I'm kind of interested in, in kind of aligning, if you like, a lived experience of the world with scientific facts or theories about it. You can stop, you can stop that. Yeah. Basically, it's, um, I think that the imperfect world of direct experience plays a really vital role in our understanding of kind of abstract theoretical concepts. I take a transdisciplinary approach, not for the sake of it, actually, but usually when I'm following a particular train of thought. Um, I think about facts as not being self-evident objects in the world, but really as kind of processes. Uh, and I'm interested in where these kind of things rupture into something kind of more speculative or in something that can't be so easily uh, defined. Um, a constable studied the meteorological research of Luke Howard. Turner painted the morning after the deluge, after the then president of the Royal Academy translated Goethe's theory of color, which is anti-Newtonian. Early telescopes evolved from devices used by Renaissance artists to obtain perspective, camera, obscura, pantograph. The first radio telescope was built by an engineer in his backyard at a time when radio engineering and astronomy were not actually linked or related. Photography and cinema, as two major art forms, both evolved from scientific studies of optics mixed with the works, work of chemists, businessmen, and artists. But I'm not actually, I, all of these things show, I'm not actually about collaboration uh, for its own sake. I'm not actually interested in kind of some kind of ugly hybrid and us making ugly hybrids of disciplines. And, I, and I, I, I'm wary of, uh, uh, I think collaboration is a term that you need to, it needs to be thought about. I'm actually all for the autonomy of art, and I, but I, what I am absolutely all for is for dialogue. I'm all for discourse and dialogue. I do think, and I have found absolutely, the dialogue and discourse with other disciplines, with other methodologies, and looking at other methodologies and ways of doing things can hugely inform your practice, and that's what I'm all for. So it's not actually about necessarily making something together, but it's about being informed, and I mean really informed, about other people's practices and ways of doing things. I think that... Uh, we're all very specialised and we've gone into specialised routes and specialisation is necessary. You can't know about everything in the world as much as we'd like to or I'd like to. Um, and that I think, but I think that you really have got to be more informed about other debates. You know, there's a cultural radio station, I think in France, which plays, talks about culture in a very critical way. Like I think it's on uh, one day a week or it's on all the time. It's a lot more critical cultural debate happening. Um, and I think that the only thing you need to do is suspend prejudice. Uh, park preconceptions. I think the only thing you need to do is suspend prejudice when you enter into another field or engage with other practitioners from another field. So that's kind of the